Please let us turn our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. And our text is found in verses 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 11. This is the infallible word of God. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we awake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. Let us seek God's face again. Lord, this is your, your word. We need you to unfold it before our eyes. Please, Lord, Give us ears to hear. Speak to our hearts. Convert the unconverted. Lord, bring back those who have astrayed and strengthen the weak. We ask you that your spirit will be our teacher this morning. In Christ's name, amen. We just celebrated Christmas this past month in remembrance of a day when Jesus came to this world humble as a babe in a manger. But men love darkness rather than light. So Jesus was rejected, humiliated. He was murdered. But we know that's not the end of the story. He conquered death. He ascended to heaven and promised to come back. And his return is certain and unavoidable. The scripture describes Christ's return as a terrifying day to unbelievers. In the second coming, Jesus will not come as a humble Savior anymore. He will come in all his glory and might to judge the living and the dead. Our text today is about this day, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is an expression used in the Old Testament to refer to God's day of vengeance against the ungodly and at the same time a day for salvation of his people. In the Old Testament times, given to the rebellion of the nations, and ultimately, even the rebellion of, of Israel itself, God promised through the prophets over and over again that he will come in judgment. It is about this that Paul is speaking here. Throughout human history, we see many instances of this judgment. 
we see Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the flood in the times of Noah sweeping out almost 100% of humanity. And uh, we see Egypt and the ten plagues because they did not let God's people go. We see the exile, and we can think of many others, but all of those were predictions of what's going to happen, what is going to be fulfilled in the day that Jesus comes back to this world. All of those. But for Christians, it will be a glorious day. It will be a day of final rescue. That wrath will not touch those who are in Christ. This truth should encourage us to live a holy life and to be filled with hope as we wait for that day. However, I don't know if you have experienced this, but even the saved, when thinking of that day of reckoning, we might look at our shortcomings and think and be afraid that that wrath will destroy us. And apparently, this was the case with the Thessalonians. They were concerned about the end times. That is desirable. They asked the apostle about the destiny of the dead in chapter 4. And now they are interested. They want to know about the destiny of the living. Nevertheless, they had the wrong focus. They thought that the best way to be prepared was to avoid surprise. And uh, know exactly a date when that is going to take place. And in response to that, Paul affirms something that Jesus has already taught. It is not for us to know times and seasons. It will be a surprise to everyone. Many people think they can predict. They have tried, but they all failed. The Apostle Paul teaches Christians to be prepared by living a lifestyle of constant readiness. Paul addresses the wrong understanding of the Thessalonians regarding Jesus' return, drawing a sharp distinction between believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers, they live in darkness. And that has impact in their conduct. They are unprepared. They live as though there will be no judgment day. They live now, for today only. As Paul said in the preceding chapter, unbelievers have no hope in the future. But God's people, on the other hand, they do not live in darkness. They know that they will come. And that, that knowledge should impact their conduct as well. It's stirring them up to live always ready. We should be ready today. And we should be comforted by the hope that awaits us. Our final rescue. Believers, our response to the second coming will inevitably influence how we live. The knowledge of Christ's coming puts our lives into the right perspective. It influences your present and it influences your future. And uh, because of this, we should be thinking of it more frequently. We should be thinking of it all the time. And this is why I think we should consider this text seriously and solemnly. 
we are going to see how the scripture teaches us to be prepared for the second coming in three points. First, to be prepared is to become children of light. Second, to be prepared is to live as children of life. And third, to be prepared is to set our hopes in Christ. Our first point is to be prepared is to become children of light. Verse 5 says, You are sons of light and sons of the day. This is the first argument that Paul uses to teach the Thessalonians how to wait for that day. But what does it mean to be sons of light, to be sons of the day? In this passage, Paul uses a lot of metaphors. In the first three verses, we see him talking about a thief in the night and a, a, a woman in, a, in travail for childbirth to represent, to talk about Christ's return. As we know, a thief does not announce before he comes. He breaks into a house suddenly and unexpectedly. In the case of a pregnant woman, once her labors begin, the process is irreversible. The pain will only increase until the process finishes. So it will be in the case of Jesus' coming. It will be sudden. It will be unexpected. And once the process begins, there will be no turning back. Paul uses the categories of light and day, darkness and night, to allude to the condition of both converted and unconverted. Light and day, darkness and night, are put in contrast to one another. They are very well-known physical categories that, in the text, tells us about the condition of both saved and unsaved. Night represents the state of ignorance and estrangement to God. Darkness refers to the empire of darkness from where Jesus rescued us. When Adam first sinned against God, we all sinned with him. And we became darkness. We became darkness. We became God's enemies and children of wrath. According to Ephesians 5 verse 8, the problem of natural man is not that he has a little bit of darkness inside of him. It's not that he's in a little bit of darkness, but it is his own nature and the place where he belongs, darkness. We are all born in sin and estrangement to God. What about day and light? What do they represent here? Well, we know in the scriptures, Jesus declares that he is the light of the world. So for one to be in the day means that the light of Christ has dispelled the darkness in his heart. So in a certain sense, if you are in Christ, you live always in the day. Therefore, any time Christ comes, it will be day for believers. It will be like day. You may wonder, if so, how does darkness become light? Well, we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light by believing in the light of the world, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It is by faith in Jesus that you can become sons and daughters of light. 
Through Christ, we are adopted into God's family. The Apostle Paul is telling to the Thessalonians that they have undergone this transformation. By believing in Christ, they have been justified. They have a new nature. You see, they not only have some light, they are not in, in some a little bit of light, but they have become light themselves. Jesus identifies believers in what way? You are the light of the world. That's how the, he identifies believers. It is a supernatural change. It cannot be done by ourselves, but, but worked in us through the Holy Spirit. But how can Paul be so sure that the Thessalonians have been born again? How can anyone assess that he or she has become children of light? What Paul is doing here, he's not merely cheering up the Thessalonians. He has seen the fruit of the gospel in their lives. If you go back to chapter 1, you will see that they have set their hopes in Christ. They have received the word of God as the word of God and not of men. They have turned from the idols to worship the living God. And now they are trying to be prepared for the second coming. And I really hope that that's you today. That you have set your hopes only in Jesus Christ. That you have turned from whatever idols you had in your heart and you live each day pursuing sanctification as you anticipate that day, as you wait for Jesus' return. But notice that Paul is very careful here. He wants to encourage Christians, but he knows the heart of, of sinners because he was one. We can use encouragement, can't we, sometimes, to live a life of little regard for sanctification. Some may even say, well, if I have been saved by grace, why worry? I can live in whatever kind of life that I wish. I can live in whatever way. For where grace, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. But you know, this text leaves no room for such carnal logic. In Romans 1, in Romans 6, the two first verses, Paul anticipates this foolish conclusion of those who might want to use God's grace as an excuse to live a life of licentiousness. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And Paul himself answers with sanctified logic. Certainly, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin, live any longer there is. Brothers and sisters, if we look to what we were, we were darkness, deep darkness. And to who God is, He's pure, pure light. If we acknowledge what Christ has done for us, he has saved us from darkness. If we consider what we were saved from, the wrath of a righteous God, then we will see sin as a mortal enemy. And rightly so. In light of this, how do we live a lifestyle that is compatible with our hope 
the hope of our final rescue. And this is our second point. To be prepared is to live as children of light. What does light do? Well, it shines, doesn't it? It shines, and Paul teaches us what this shining look like following his pattern of contrasting things. Darkness, light, believers, unbelievers. Children of light should not fall into a spiritual slumbering. Instead, they should be watchful and sober. Verse 6 says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. As others do refers to the fact that sleeping is the normal spiritual condition of unbelievers. But Christians, listen please, Christians can temporarily fall into this mistake. Do not sleep means do not fall into a spiritual apathy and indifference to the truths of the Bible, such as the truth of the second coming. How do unbelievers live? Well, they live as in the days of Noah before the flood. They ignore the warnings like people before the flood. Warnings of judgment. They live like life is all about eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Because all they have in life is here and now. They are guided by their lusts and sensuality. They do not listen to the warnings. They are sleeping. By contrast, believers are called to be awake and to be watchful. Verse 6 says, let us watch. Let us watch. The scriptures urge us constantly to be in a state of spiritual awareness. Spiritual awareness keep us from falling into temptation. One way we can be watchful against sin is by being in constant prayer. The scriptures associate frequently watchfulness with prayer. In Gethsemane, Jesus rebukes the sleeping disciples, saying, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. When I think of a man after God's heart, I think of David. But sadly, he's also an example of a true believer who fell asleep. And we know it was a costly sleep. David loved the Lord, but we know that as he aged, he grew quite confident of himself. He indulged himself in idleness and covetousness. In a day of idleness, he saw Bathsheba bathing and he wanted to possess her. He committed adultery and to hide his sin, he killed an innocent man, one sin after the other. And during a certain time, he did not repent and he did not confess his sin. David needed Nathan to come and tell a parable to him. But even as Nathan told him the parable, David would not see his own sin. He needed Nathan, the prophet, to openly declare it to him. David was not watching. He was sleeping. It is always a proper time to examine ourselves to see if we are growing accustomed to our sin, if we are becoming insensitive to it. 
because his spiritual is leaping, will not come to us without a great cost to our souls. David did not lose his salvation because he had been born again, but he experienced a real drought in his soul. He experienced separation from God, and he lost the joy of his salvation. This is how serious it is. Christians are called to be sober. Verses 6 and 8 repeat that. Spiritual soberness in opposition to being drunk with the pleasures of sin. Unbelievers have their sense of spiritual discernment disturbed. They call good evil and evil good. Be sober means to be self-controlled. Even when doing lawful things, we, should, we need sobriety. As we engage in our daily responsibilities, we can be too focused on them that we lose sight of the world to come. Career, studies, marriage, friendship, leisure, they should all be enjoyed with sobriety as proper of those who wait for Jesus' return. Now, none of these virtues are possible to us by wishful thinking or by the power of our minds, are they? No, absolutely not. So how can we grow in them? And this is something that is unique to Christianity. All other religions in the world will throw you back to yourselves. Only Christianity, only in Jesus, we are offered the power to obey what God commands. And this, this is our third point. To be prepared is to set our hopes in Christ. This put on of verse 8 tells us how it happens. By union with Christ, by being clothed with him. In Christian life, the indicative comes before the imperative. What do I mean by that? First, God shows us a reality. First, God acts, and then he asks us to do things. We just mentioned the law a few minutes ago. God did not start, do not have other gods before me. He said, I am the Lord your God. I have delivered you from bondage. And then he gives the commandments. First, God does something to his people. And then he asks for things. First, we need to be made children of life. Children of light. Before we can live a lifestyle of preparation for Christ's return. Verse 9 and 10 pack everything together. No Christian virtue. No Christian virtue is possible apart from Christ. It is because he died that we can live a new life. It is because of Jesus. Now, in union with him, whether we are awake or asleep, whether we are dead or alive when he comes, we will go live together with him. There is no Christian living without faith in Christ. Faith that works love. And faith that hopes. Hopes for our final act of salvation. Faith, love, and hope. The three things that are favorite of Paul. They make up the Christian armor for a spiritual battle. 
The foundation and the crown of our hope is in Christ. God did not overlook sin. The wages of sin is death. God hates sin. He punishes it. But if you believe in Christ, your judgment day happened thousands of years ago on that cross where Christ died for you. If you believe in him. When about to face death, what did Jesus ask? He asked, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And was it passed from him? It was not. And why was it not? So that it could be passed for, from us. If we set our hopes in him. Our hope in the last day, it stands on the solid ground of Jesus' works. And in the word of God that says that God is faithful and just to forgive sins if we repent and if we confess. In conclusion, I would just like to, to remind all of us who are God's children we are to be ready for the second coming. But the way to be ready is not to look for a date, but walk as children of light, leaning on the Savior, remembering that God, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, this is a great comfort for Christians. Comfort for you concerning your loved ones who died. Because the Bible says that they will be the first one to rise to meet Jesus in that glorious day. It is a promise. And there is comfort also for the living Christian. When the Lord Jesus descends from heaven, there will be a shout of an archangel announcing his coming. And we will, after our loved ones who died in Christ, we will meet the Lord in the air. And our perfect fellowship with him will begin to have no end. I wish I thought more of this truth. I wish I consider more frequently what they mean to us as Christians, for then I would understand the, the words of Paul when he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. I wonder what things would be like if we encourage brothers and sisters who are going through hardship with these words, being that they are very real and sure. I believe trials would be much more bearable if we did. So, let us encourage one another and edify one another with these words. Amen. Let us pray.